This oh. is your bar? No. I oh. got it. I'm explaining. Uh, okay. At Niven Bar. Yeah, is that how you pronounce it? Because the guy was running revolver, um, he saw some kids doing graffiti or some adults doing graffiti, and he said, mm-hmm. stop doing graffiti, and they caught him. And he got, like, a lot of money uh, because of that. Oh, uh, wow. Like, from... They were taken by the police, and they had to pay, like, damages. And so we had... Uh, he was snooping around for uh, another place to open something. Because he already runs the revolver stuff, which is... Uh, it's a bar and it's uh, like a, a restaurant and a, a live uh, venue. Uh-huh. Uh, but he uh, he started this, and then he just sort of gave it to us, the Colbotten people crew, oh, wow. more or less. So we're all involved in it with this. I had a meeting with me. I was supposed to be the uh, musical director for it. So that's the experiment: trying to run a bar without playing uh, what they do at metal discos or other metal places here. Uh-huh. We just play good shit. Uh-huh. Which so is not basically just 60s, 70s, 80s, or new stuff that sounds like 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah. That's what m- most of our crew uh, is into anyway. Yeah. Uh, so far, so good, but I don't know about the financial situation. Uh, if you play commercial stuff instead of this good stuff then you get more customers that's how it is in this sort of small town yeah Just 500,000 oh, people is that, living that's here a, that's it? yeah in Oslo yeah oh wow but we got uh, many gigs uh, every night uh, so I think it was one of the two cities in Europe that has most gigs per, per day uh-huh. it's Oslo but it didn't used to be like that 80s sucked and as you know the beginning of the 80s sucked metal wise as, as well uh, yeah you may, you may not know that but that's the way no it was. I do so when the Metallian magazine mm-hmm. uh, uh, Slayer mag uh, came around and, and Mayhem uh, at the same time it was like it was just a window to to the to our pre-internet which was the the global uh, metal underground and the scenes and radio shows and everything was connected it just took a while you know the snail yeah. mail and everything but that was basically internet just for us yeah i got that uh, that book the slayer magazine book that's really cool with all the have you seen that yeah but uh Slayer mag and and the magazines was really it's really interesting in the beginning of the career uh-huh. you have to make a network and find out all the cool bands and then suddenly you're on a roll and then you don't need them as much anymore so uh, the Slayers that were important for me was the eighty seven one and eighty eight maybe uh-huh. and after that I didn't have many Slayer mags oh okay oh. <laughs> Uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. What is Who's this? Again? this? Captain Beyond? Oh, I don't know. Captain Beyond, I think. Captain Beyond. So do you, you program all the music that's no, played no, here? No, no, uh, At the beginning, I had to... I did that. Uh-huh. Uh, s- sort of the... the, the bar- some of the bartenders already knew what was going to happen. Some maybe needed some lists to, to sort of get into what I wanted with this place and... Uh, now they're basically playing uh, what they want to. Uh, yeah. It's not like a train or anything. Mo- people that work here sort of have to have great music taste. Yeah. You can't have, or our music taste anyway, our music taste, what we think are, is, is great. Mm-hmm. And then does this place have playlists listed anywhere? Like if, you, if I wanted to go see like yeah, what... I made the playlist. But I mean like could it, can you go on the internet and be see like what's playing this week or whatever? Or in no, general? because we don't know that in advance. Everyone just want to play whatever they feel like. You know? Uh-huh. It's not, but that's basically a good idea, but... Because, like, this... I don't think no one is sort of... They're not... It sounds like you're really up your own ass, too, when you're doing that, actually. You just sit down and just plan, like, eight hours of music and put it out there. Or that even maybe do it. a lot of spare time. Yeah. <laughs> most people don't hear. Yeah. But, I mean, like, a way you could go back and be like, oh, what was some of the stuff I heard at the bar last night you could go and check I out? Just, I just 
ever did I play with one DJ that did that actually wrote down the stuff and that's just because he played for like three hours if you play a marathon set and get wasted you don't know what you did the last three hours I'm telling you that's impossible yeah impossible you're not gonna you're gonna party and try to talk to people and you're not gonna jot down yeah write down playing. everything it's, forget it <laughs> it's not happening I don't is it really like that in the states sometimes? no 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 but I <laughs> it sounds unusual no sometimes if you do it like I just like copy and paste the whole iTunes playlist or something, like from my radio show. I just cu- just do all one. I was supr- yeah, it- you play from vinyl or CDs. So yeah, yeah, and- yeah. So you have to write that down. A lot of people would be surprised. Like you're, you're into way more music than it's, you're into all kinds of music, not just metal. It's always been uh, that, that way, uh, mm-hmm. and also meeting people like Euronymous and, and uh, Metallion in uh, '87, uh, you figure out there's other freaks out there that like all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. So that was encouraged. Now there was like after '93 and 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 a little bit into the '90s, all those styles that used to be a primordial soup in the '80s were sort of Nietzscheified. Mm-hmm. And in Germany, we could hear tales that people wearing death metal shirts at black metal shows were frowned upon or even, you know, hassled or kicked. <laughs> and yeah. the other way around, and thrash people couldn't go to death shows and stuff like that. It's like they tore down the wall, but woo, they were real <laughs> building up new ones. Right? Yeah. And we never had it like that here. Uh, that's when, you know, the. Then came the people also here after 93 where the whole murder and church burnings went like like a blaze into the media worldwide S- people started coming to elm street rock cafe to meet us mm-hmm. but a, some of these people or maybe like let's say 50 50 yeah they had something that we didn't they were just like black metal is the only thing and of course man if you take that fucking travel from the south america you're basically into that <laughs> you know but yeah we were into all c- kinds of stuff all the time at least the the, the older ones and then mm-hmm. there was like, like a hard decade with a lot of people like that and then came new kids that were just they were born sort of with internet or they got into the internet when they were 12 13 and if they liked something, they could just check it out and check out all the other stuff. And you had, like, musical geniuses at, twen- at 20 years old. And I was like, I don't know, I was 34, 35. And I was looking at these young ones going, like, fuck, they know a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when I was a kid, I had to buy, like, five albums and hope that there was, like, at least one or two good ones. Yeah. I, I guess you can remember. Yeah, it's I mean, I I think that's cool how Dark Throne also has changed to incorporate all sorts of like it's some of it's it's like there's big super melodic. It's almost like yeah, but in hindsight, I'm seeing like uh, we went we were the first retro band like um, um, in this scene anyway. Yeah, as we already learned how to play a lot uh, mm-hmm. or play uh, our instruments. We were sort of painting ourselves into a corner of technicality, actually, on that Gold Lord album. That was the second death metal album we almost did. So our switch to black metal was really, we really knew we were ditching all the technical stuff and going for caveman shit like Hellhammer, Celtic Frost. Uh, that Celtic Frost actually was the beginning. I even started a band, so I was like back to the beginning again. In yeah. Sort of. Sort of. Uh, but the, a lot of the other bands they were still learning and they switched to black metal while they were learning and they continued the progression that's why Emperor would go like I guess I haven't even heard more than two and a half minutes from this Night Side Eclipse album but I'm mm-hmm. hearing and thinking they're going into a really progressive thing there while we were going like yeah like this uh, that's what happened that's mm-hmm. how and I felt a lot of other people going in this progressive direction. We were going caveman style. Um, so the retro thing started there. And since then, it's been basically what I've been doing. Retro, 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 retro. I haven't done any riff that's sort of looking to the future, dude. 
Uh, yeah. So in '93 was a big year for me, uh, being more and more upset with the current current state of affairs because I had already seen like what we could call some sort of pure thrash, sort of becoming really boring. Like the Germans do it, did it too technical, and the American bands did it too straight. Like Death Angel, Testament, Metallica s- started straightening up th- uh, their sounds in the late '80s, and then the death metal that we knew. You know, we skipped playing death metal because we thought it was sort of starting to sound too polished and everything. There yeah. Was a little death left in it. Uh, so I'd seen that crumble as well. And now the black metal thing that I was, thought was like the, the final frontier. There was still no band that had any artificial sound or anything. That started to crumble. So I'm looking at myself in 93, real vivid memory of me just two blocks from here. I was going to the... Uh, uh, house and techno store, the only one that was in Oslo at the time, listening intensely to Flotsam and Jetsam's first album. Mm-hmm. I never s- really stopped listening to it, but 93, it's been thrash metal been fucked, death metal been fucked, now black metal was crumbling, and I was definitely uh, going back in time listening to a lot of stuff and, and having even time to discover stuff I, I missed out on in the 80s uh, already, like Fate's Warning. Uh, Mm-hmm. And I was getting into these sorts of things while I was... The, the thing that was future for me then was, of course, the house and techno stuff. I refused to take anything futuristic or progressive into Darkroom. Darkroom was going caveman and whatever aspirations I had for doing something beyond... Uh, that was just checking it out in another style. And I never let yeah. my huge interest for for electronic uh, rhythmic music uh, I never really let that influence Darktron and I've been really clear on that other bands really started to incorporate that as well mm-hmm. uh, but I'm not going into it uh, 94 till 99 was real bleak years for metal I'm one of those curmudgeons or uh-huh. whatever you oh no yeah that goes there uh, yeah definitely I strongly believe this Oh yeah, it's absolutely yeah. true. So you have a question for me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I never have questions. But no, I um, I've been really getting into your uh, band of the week on Facebook. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, how do you find uh, so much of that stuff? Because it's not anywhere. Or I mean, it's not. You know, it's hard to you know find the releases. I don't need the releases uh, beforehand. Uh, I uh, in the beginning it was like, yeah, I actually preferred having the the, the band's whole uh, release or mm-hmm. releases, and then sort of make trying to make some decisions and uh, and that was when I had like four or twelve bands and now we're up in soon three hundred bands and uh, things go faster. I just need a uh, one cool song from band and I'll consider but if I know the rest sucks then I will be a little bit standoffish but uh uh-huh. so you won't you won't ever be if the band only has one song you might not include them for me to DJ anything just means like one fucking song I have one song with Woody Guthrie that will be on the CD I give you and that's the one I'm gonna play uh, it's not like if I play Woody Guthrie out doesn't mean I have to know anything else because after a while, you, be, uh, you become uh, more and more the DJ disease, which is yeah. you rarely get time to enjoy full albums like you did when you were a kid. Yeah. And I mean, most grown-ups know that you get more and more into single songs, but DJs have that immensely. Uh, so they just want to find tracks. And it's to the point where I don't want an album to be real good. I want it to be mediocre and have two <laughs> awesome songs because that's simpler. Now I've yeah. got lots of uh, whole albums when I DJ metal that I see because I rate everything on little notes. And uh-huh. I see everything has like 56 out of 60, uh-huh. but every song, and I'm like, <sighs> nah, I don't choose any of them then, but if, uh, if it was like... 40 out of 60, 40 out of 60, and one that had like 58 out of 60, of course I'm going to play it. Yeah. That's the DJ disease uh-huh. right there. That's Ru- one yeah, of you the root for the underdog. I kind of like that better too with bands like that have like a, like a band like Cheap Trick. 
they have some great the first few records i think are great and then it gets like real spotty but then it becomes like the challenge to to find that you managed to pound one of my musical black holes there sir wait you don't you don't like cheap trick no uh, musical black holes means they went on the radar haven't got into them Oh, oh, you, oh, you haven't gotten into them. No, no, that's a black hole. Uh, oh, that's oh, a black hole. Oh, oh, I see. You got a black hole in your collection. I mean, that's mean. That means you don't have it. Like, I know more about the Doobie Brothers than I do Cheap Trick, and uh, it's no comparisons or anything. And that's that's just the first thing I, up uh -huh. in my head. I was amazed we were talking about this before we started recording, but that you liked the Roaches song that you heard, which I, a lot of people would be surprised female folk group well you made um, a valid point I'm thinking um, what's strange is, is that Nico got so many fans and got so famous like it's not really because of the only the music it can't be really seriously it yeah. can't be it has to be something like oh she must be feeling alienated being a foreigner and a And a strange, but and, and then it all ties in with the Woodstock feeling. No, the weirdo stuff. Maybe there's a, a little uh, Jack Kerouac uh, in there somewhere. Uh, yeah, just, it was the timing was right for that thing. But uh, whereas I would say I'm a fan of the first Susan Vega album, and that's only music. Mm -hmm. It's no like big trend up and on thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously. My name is so Luca. Good. Uh, no, that's the second one. That's the second one. Yeah, that's the second oh one. wow, he's schooled me. <laughs> <laughs> School. <laughs> I thought that was the first one. Well, that was your point. I mean, uh, you made about the roaches like mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's like Nico. It's just in tune. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, man. I think Nico is a little bit overrated. I mean, I remember the song's easy to remember something like Chelsea Girls, but I don't even know if she wrote that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so I was never a huge fan of Nico. No, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll see where it goes with the roaches. But um, I'm telling you, I got the DJ this season. I actually just need like one track. Oh, I'll send you. I, I'll uh, shoot. Could I email it to you? Or do you not listen to MP3s? Yeah, MP3s are fine. Okay, I'll send fine. that to you. But they're great. They do. Uh, so I heard. Yeah, yeah. That's good stuff. And you discovered Ghost, one of my favorite bands. Well, pre you know, you with the band of the week. Yeah, yeah. Um. That was real early uh, mm -hmm. because um, we had uh, some um, club nights called Let the Streets Burn, uh, 2007, 2008, uh, 2009, then probably stretched into 2010, I don't know. But anyway, one of the guys in that crew was hanging around and he was the Swede and he gave me... I don't know if it was one or three songs and just said, listen to this. It was his new band that he was in. And right off the bat, it was awesome. Yeah, great. And that was... Uh, it was great to see that uh, flower so quickly because I thought it was almost impossible that that can happen anymore and it rarely does mm -hmm. I mean breaking through like that was way easier in the 80s and then harder in the 90s in the 2000s damn hard and then in the 2010s almost impossible but Ghost did that yeah basically because they had a, a, a weird and dry but still airy sort of uh, soundscape uh, and then damn catchy songs which I've been trying to explain can have A little to do with this and a little to do with that. But I feel a lot of people want to get into that um, recipe on how it really went that quick. But it's impossible. Yeah. It's contrafactual history writing to, to delve into uh, how it could happen mm -hmm. like that with them. But it was a great band. Uh, I enjoyed most of the first album. Then the second one I listened to. But now it's in the... You got a, st a storage place for vinyl. Uh, I'm not going to listen to. For, I think for there's so some good. I think yeah, the first one I think is great from start to finish. The second one is more some. There's like A tracks and B tracks. Oh, I should be the last one to complain that people. 
thought Dark Throne only were, was good for like two or three albums because I was always like that myself. I move quickly on, so incredibly quickly, mm -hmm. which I sort of touched on earlier when I just leave death metal even before it sort of blew up. Yeah. And yeah, that's that will be me. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, and I always start the uh, the um, the evenings early and leave early as well. So it's, like <laughs> it's just it's me being like that. Anyway, it's a, it's a good. Um Whoa! Strike! <laughs> Nailed it! Oh, nice! It's only love. Zz top preference. Love Zz. Yeah, but I have a problem with that Bill Ham dude that put uh, reverb on the drum kit in the 70s on CC Top. That was not cool. I'm one of the guys that think that when they f when that Bill Ham finally cut out all the reverb on the drums on the Deguello album, that's the best album. Mm -hmm. And all the albums should have had like dry fucking drums like that. Yeah, so I mean then then come Eliminators all over. Yeah, that one only have like one good song or something for me, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm not thinking it's the regular song that people think to. I, I'm 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 rating all the stuff I told you earlier. Yeah, um, and I remember that it was one How song do you that rate surprised it? me. Uh, Whoa, they're really cutting into the profits. Cutting in. <laughs> Um, how I write? Well, yeah, in the do you beginning, have, what's your system? In the beginning, it was because I was DJing, uh, or well, I was thinking I might DJ this album, but I, I bought like a lot of uh, albums and CDs at the time, actually. This was like late 90s, and I started to scratch with a key on, uh, on, the, um, on the CD cover. So, like, song number eight was great, it was like, under the eight, so. If I was drunk playing the uh, metal uh, at the Elm Street pub, for instance, I could just oh yeah, that's the one, boom. And this sort of sort of started like into I brought little notes with me to work, mm -hmm. and I started writing and doing underlinings. And now it's like three lines, and every one is like twenty. <laughs> uh -huh. Twenty. Uh, but are there different categories that you rate? Like, I mean, it, the ratings are for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but I'm I'm saying. When I die, it'll be probably fun. That's what I mean. So we have to decipher it. it. <laughs> it's probably fucking funny. But a lot <laughs> of the stuff that could be funny, like things I don't like and stuff, I just pass on to mm -hmm. the NASA rule store or something like that. Maybe, and he, and I, I, I pass it on with the notes. But he doesn't like the notes being in, of course, because then he can't sell it. Uh -huh. it uh, Oaks are like, this is crap. <laughs> 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 so... Well, that's fucked. Uh, anyway, we're worried for the cutting of the process. Yeah, hope he's all right. I can't remember the question. You what? A, how? How much? How big is your collection? Or is it always kind of stuff coming in and going out? From now on, it will be like that. Uh, because I can't, I can't really deal with all the titles anymore, and I. It's extremely depressing, depressive to think that. I'm 42, and half of my shit I will never get to listen to ever again. So now I've been starting to starting to throw away stuff. Even burnt CDs. What? I love burnt CDs. No problem with yeah. me, man. Uh, and a lot of the LPs I don't like. It's on storage, and then after a while, maybe I give them away uh, or trade them. Uh, so the collection doesn't have to be more than like eight, nine thousand for me, like constantly. And then something comes in, something goes out. Wow. Wait, it's so you possible mean you to do that when you get tired enough? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, so you can't listen to half of it just because you think there's so much? You'll, no, I you'll, know I yeah. won't be able to get the time to listen to half of it because there's always new stuff. Oh coming, yeah, yeah. You no, know? and and forty years I've used, and I won't live another forty years probably. Yeah, you will. So that's Maybe. the problem right <laughs> there. You know? And I don't. I like to not have a lot of stuff. Uh -huh. I'm throwing away stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. Travel light or whatever. Even though I don't travel. Yeah, that's, you were that saying that. That doesn't fucking add up at all. But still, it's it's neat not to have. You don't leave stuff. Oslo. Uh, 
no, that's a hassle. Not for DJ <laughs> uh, or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, you I pro- that. you could probably people would probably hire you all over the world. Doesn't that ever get tempting? Did it... no? No, it's not tempting because here I go out, I come back, I've been DJing, great stuff, uh, and I don't have to tell anyone that I'm DJing. Um, I'm DJing to random people. Mm-hmm. I can get new friends sometimes, uh, just randomly. Uh, whereas if I go on a DJ uh, tour, people will meet up with a lot of expectations, and they want to meet you and talk. And I don't like to talk when I'm playing music. I just want to listen to the songs I'm playing and find the next song. I don't really have time to talk. Yeah. And that's easier to do here. And also, I I, I go to work because I still have the 70% uh, what do you say? 70% job? It's like I wor- work work like four, three, four days a week. Oh, at the post office still? No, well, it's a postal system. It's like industry. It's like assembly line. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a, the biggest building for that. And that's like, it's it's total industry. Oh, so it's not like you're, you don't deal with customers. You're, you're like back in the... No, I never dealt with customers. Oh. Uh, how would I... How would I listen to music then? Yeah. I mean, I go to work, and then I work seven hours, but at the same time, I sit there with a headset on, and I can rate. So oh, actually, so I'm you're doing seven hours of work, but I'm doing seven hours of music work as well, so it works out really well. Oh, now, wow, that's perfect. In the weekends, I can DJ, mm-hmm. and then I can have a party on the Saturday or whatever. If I would all the time go out of the country to play, uh, you think that's... I mean, I always now have a wife. That would not be cool. Oh, you have a wife. Oh. So, uh, and it's not cool for me either. I just hate traveling. Mm Mm-hmm. Really do. I mean, pathologically. (laughs) (laughs) How close do you live to here, to downtown Oslo? Oh, yeah, that was a crisis before. You were just like, I'm on the train. I'm going to be in Oslo West in 15 minutes. And I'm like, 15 minutes? I thought it was going to take much longer. It's really fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it would take like an hour or a half or something. Okay. I think I I could have told you. I didn't know you didn't know. I didn't know because I looked up on... uh, the the maps and it may I think maybe it was tell, saying how long it would take by bus or something. Sorry about that. So I was uh, obviously a bit confused as well. I was thinking you were um, counting on there being delays or something. Oh no! So I thought I it was going to take you way like longer. Uh, fifteen thirty or fifteen forty-five or something, but. There we were, like, 14.40, and you're like, I'm on the train. <laughs> and I'm like, I got 15 minutes just to walk to the subway fr- mm-hmm. uh, in the suburbs, and then there's another 17 minutes down or something like that. Yeah. Uh, the snow down here doesn't look good because we're just above uh, fjord level here. 10 meters above, but in the suburbs, there's just heaps of snow. And every suburb is by the forest line. Mm-hmm. So there's great systems for uh, cross-country skiing. Oh, nice. Do you do that? Yeah. Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah, it's my, much wetter here. I'm right I'm right around the corner, the hotel. Oh! It worked out well. Fantastic. Yeah. They have an ACDC pinball machine. I Dead forget moon. what it's called. Who is this? Dead Moon. Nice. Australia, they're famous. Doing everything themselves. Record, even press their own albums. Where are they, they, fr- got a, they got a vinyl press. Oh, really? Yeah, they've been existing for years and years. 80s, probably. Dead Moon, I think. Wait. I always thought they were from Australia, but where are they from? Yeah, where are they from? Portland. Oh, my God, oh really? Out, <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be packed to the gig. 
Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all about the uh, the soul that the vocalists got. Yeah, yeah. With it's really good. And they're really lo-fi and been famous for being lo-fi. Mm-hmm. For ages and ages and ages. And then how... Dead Moon, that... You sh- I'm I know, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> it's really surprising. I got to play them on my radio show. They're even more famous than the frogs, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so how often are you doing Dark Throne? Like, how, how often do you guys get together to do that? Well, what did I do today? I wake up at 6.37 and I go Whoa. straight on the computer doing an uh, interview with Brazil about Sarko. Fago and other Brazilian bands. Mm-hmm. Um, then some dude from Argentina that's writing a book uh, sent me a docx file, and I was lucky enough to catch my girlfriend just before she was going out the door. She could help me open that because I'm obviously a fucking moron around <laughs> computers. Didn't get a computer until 2005, and that's because I was tired of doing phoners in phone interviews. Uh-huh. I was real damn tired of that, so I was thinking, I okay, can do all this stuff on email like back in the day I went one year of school after the elementary school only one year and the only thing I learned from that year was doing t- touch Uh huh. the touch method and I was best in my class and why was that yeah because I was already writing letters with the entire underground so the other guys would learn touch at school and then just leave the fucking they wouldn't re- rehearse on the on the typewriter but I got like this rehearsal down so that's a, I can do a lot of this typing and I'm good at it that's why I can do so many interviews and that's why I wanted to change to doing email interviews instead of phoners because phoners I hate talking on the phone I don't talk to my wife on the phone I just load it mm-hmm. and then phoners were always like saying like yeah we'll call 7 o'clock in the evening and then they never call and shit like that so you got like no I can't do this I can't do that I got a phone interview and it doesn't happen yeah now with emails you can choose when you do it yeah so it took me until 2005 to figure that shit out that I could actually get a computer and what happened then I discovered MySpace and just like okay I'm gonna get into this and it suddenly that was just exploding yeah and that's where the band of the week started right yeah after a while because I basically what I didn't want to do when I got into techno and house was destroy the magic by making it myself I would instead start DJing it like beat mixing with with Mm -hmm. vinyls now with MySpace I was already on to something but I knew that if I started with Facebook as well I would just jump and use too much time and my emails are a plenty Mm-hmm. And I can't just juggle both Facebook and this email accounts. That would really yeah. the work would suffer. Yeah, you quit. Phil and someone was telling me you quit Facebook. Yeah, no, I was never on Facebook. You never on no, it. No, but I quit MySpace. Oh, that's wh- oh yeah. He said but yeah. He said yeah, he got when I was there. He got some emails saying you quit social media. Band of the week started on uh, on MySpace, mm-hmm. and then this Arian took it from there. My sidekick from Netherlands, and he's running all the stuff like the Facebook band of the week and everything. He does all that. Yeah, and I do the updates. posts. I make the posts, mm-hmm. and he just posts them. So I make those on email. Mm-hmm. I'm not touching Facebook. Uh, so Dark Drone is now what? It's this. Wait, checking what? Checking out the Netherlands. Printer, doing accounting shit. Mm-hmm. Very, very fucking big house, but everything is legal, not all board. Mm-hmm. That's, 19, that's that 99% is. of the time. Oh, just running the business of it. The one per- percentage left is... <laughs> and actually recording it. Yeah. Actually recording it. So that's like one or two percent, and all the rest is brain work. Mm hmm. Just and running accounting. <laughs> wow. But a lot of brain work. Because you have to choose a lot of stuff away to be able to focus to actually make some metal that someone would actually care about. Yeah. Well, it's getting, it's getting bigger and bigger, I feel like. Dark Throne now? Yeah, no? I don't know. I don't know, but we never broke through. So it's. I feel like we're just 
treading water, you know? Like every, all the time. We never broke through. Do you want to be, break through, though? I mean, like in I, a... I would like to... Uh, because what I'm doing always at the moment is like what you believe in. So you want to break yeah. through. Like you want like the mall kids to, to stop listening to... Dimu Borger or whatever. I don't know what they're listening to now, but you want them to, to get into the Swedish bands that inspire me at the moment and stuff like that. Uh -huh. But then you go five years and then you've moved on and then you're... Where, what are you thinking now? Who, what's the mall kid? What the mall kid's going to listen to now? So I don't know. Do I want to break through? Probably not then. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure as hell not lifting a finger to do it. But I mean, I feel like the music is... I don't know. I, I love it. I mean, I feel... I, and it's super... It's, it's catchy. I hope that's not like an insult in any way. But I, I would say it's almost like the... I mean, there's just huge hooks. Huge nipples? Huge, <laughs> huge nipples. <laughs> A Dark Throne has huge nipples. <laughs> you can use that blurb. That's a really ballsy thing to say, sir. Uh, on the, ne the next album, <laughs> Dark Throne has huge nipples. That'll get people's attention. No, the hooks. It's a, it's a very, very melodic. Well, you learned that from listening to Celtic Frost at a young age. To what? To listening to Celtic Frost or Celtic yeah. Frost, as a lot of Americans uh, yeah. pronounce it. You learn that at, a, at an age, like every riff doesn't have to have a break, but you got to have breaks here and there, and you got to have interesting riffs for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. What really bore us, like we went from the 70s rock and the... That was like echoes of the 60s and then a bit of the 70s and then the early 80s metal. Now, at this point, heavy metal had the best vocalist ever because kids so m in so many countries of the world wanted to do this heavy metal. Yeah. And they everyone dared to do vocals like, yeah, because that's the only vocals out there. Mm-hmm. You didn't have all the growlers or anything else like that. So yeah. That was, that was huge. But what happened uh, was a lot of copycat bands, and they were copying the most mundane or rudimentary riffs around, which to us, we start to call those riffs standard riffs. We don't want standard riffs. Mm -hmm. we w and we return to metal, but we want to do it without the standard riffs. Mm -hmm. Someone also called those roots asphalt metal. But well, basically, we're talking maybe like 82, 84 styles. Mm -hmm. It's easy to make a standard riff. Everyone knows what I'm talking about here. Like, and that's it. Yeah. For many bars. Not bars like these. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but it's boring. Um, we wouldn't want to have that. But we want, of course, to have the same rhythms. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have more spicy note combinations or try to make something original. Uh, I'm thinking we didn't have that many standard riffs in our career, but who knows? Anyway, we learned a lot from Celtic Frost because Celtic Frost had like a... Tom G. Warrior had a really basic playing style seemingly like a kid could copy them but mm -hmm. there was a genius flair to them because he used some note combinations that are odd to yeah. say the least and that's his genius and I've been making quite a lot of moolah just copying that more or less or getting into the vibe of that like getting it under his skin so to say and uh, I think I've gotten too much credit for uh for that, making the black and roll and stuff, when actually black and roll already existed, with the Venom and the the, the Hellhammer and the Celtic Frost, and just mix it up with a little Motred. Come on, man! Uh, the recipe ain't that hard, but someone had to do the black and roll as well, and I was one of the first to. to yeah, do that. I feel but like basically no, no one it existed else. already. You know, you just you have to do it again at the right time, and you never know what's the right time. But we had luck with timing as well. Not only nickel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I feel like the Norwegian bands, you guys were the, were you, you were t it's, no one else was doing stuff as, as melodic. 
Well, like I mean, now, from like no, like from like the original black metal bands and all that. I think all the other bands were melodic. I mean, had a lot of notes in it. We yeah, but not like hooks. You know what I mean? Not nipples. <laughs> Darkthorn has nipples, big nipples. Well, I actually, I did like the 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 the, the huge nipple or hook that you can <laughs> can have. <laughs> Was on when I made the Transylvanian Hunger album because then I could make a whole album on my own. And I could have the exact same drum beat on the entire A side of the album, and not before the first song on the B side. I changed from to, and usually that works. That transition works after just playing like this for 16 seconds. I did it for one entire A side and then some of the B side and then went to the half uh, tempo thing and uh, mm -hmm. that must have been one hell of a hook for for whoever was listening <laughs> I never actually saw that work I mean I could I could just picture how that would work for others to hear it for the first time like a whole A side just like and then that so I'd like to be in a Transylvanian hunger simulator <laughs> like a fight simulator. I'm simulating. I'm, well, I'm listening to it for the first time. Man, it's just the same tempo. Oh, fuck! There's the hook after fucking 22 minutes. Uh, yeah, I could never discover what I made myself. Mm -hmm. But that was a hook. That's a hook I remember anyway. Is it ever amazing to think about how how the Norwegian, like the original black metal bands from like when you when things were starting in the early 90s and all that, to now where it's, like, in, in America, like, everyone knows about it, both, like, fans of the music, but then also just, like, you know, where people who don't even listen to music are aware of the whole the whole scene. Well, to me, the important, important years were the 80s where you picked up all the stuff you needed to make black metal, and then you, mm -hmm. the, you make black metal just out of... All the stuff you got from the 80s. Mm -hmm. Because when you start making black metal in 1991, you don't have any 90s black metal to, to be influenced by. There's only 80s. Yeah. So we could basically just make 80s stuff. The, the, the fault that we did, there was three death metal songs sneaking in on the first black metal album. So everyone assumed this is something new in black metal. But we really wanted to make like an EP with just the three black metal songs on it. Everyone just thought because it was wrapped in black metal like with a black and white cover and everything they assumed everything was black metal only we knew that three of the songs were more or less death metal mm -hmm. but we wanted to have a full album out anyway uh, this was complicated uh, and I am really sorry for fucking up black metal uh, <laughs> via that way but we had it all figured out on the Under Funeral Moon album because that was basically just 80s stuff but it seems like people are not not that much into the Under Funeral Moon album, although to me it's no doubt it's the best album. Uh, so, uh, answering your question, the important years were 91 and 92. What happened after that was more or less a lot of cool bands still existing and a lot of shitty bands coming in. But before that, there was not one shitty band. Everything that had that feeling, that weirdness, that occultness, that abyssic feeling, that evil feeling, everything from Merciful Fate to Enemy to uh, Sarcophago to Blasphemy from Canada to Samael from Switzerland, all stuff like that, we drew the black metal from that. That was magic. Mm -hmm. Now in 93 and onwards, things were basically rolling by on its own and it wasn't that much interesting anymore that's what I think mm -hmm. and then after 94 I mean I can't really say it myself but I, I saw the comment this guy in record collector came by my house through the record collector magazine and he did like an article and mm -hmm. he says like this guy has virtually everything his collections a collection apart from the noticeable lack of 90s black metal in his shelves <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> Yeah, we could wrap we could wrap it up if you need to wrap it up. What's that? No, I don't need to wrap it up. Oh, okay. Can I get you a beer? Yeah. What what kind would you like? No, just 
And there was much rejoicement. Yes. Oh, taken cool. from, uh, taken from uh, Knights of the Round Table. What's that movie called again? Uh, Monty, oh, Monty Python? Monty Python? Yeah. Yeah. The one with the <laughs> knee yeah, on it. There oh, was much cool. rejoicement. Oh, I'm excited. Well, it's weirdo stuff. I usually do that every or every other year. I, I uh, pick up the mo most remarkable songs. I've, uh, I've, uh, I've stumbled over, mm -hmm. but this is part of something called a music club. But I'm, I'm, I was, I was making that for the music club, and, but also spreading it around outside the music club. So oh, cool! Wait, so look, people look at it like a, it's it's a private but official <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, compilation. I gotta get some chewing gum. Awesome. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, he's calling nice. that song, uh, believe it or not, I'm walking on air. I never <laughs> thought I could feel so free. Flying <laughs> away with a world without care. Who could it be? Believe it or not, it's just me. <laughs> I believe that's a Canadian song, actually. And that's like the basis of his answering machine. It's just 22 seconds. Obviously nice. taken from YouTube. Uh, a cool friend of mine uh, fixed me that years ago. It's called Matt McNerney, and it's playing in Hex Vessel, and now has huge success with the band Beast Milk. Beast Milk? Beast Milk was Band of the Week many years ago, and oh, I wow. expected them to make it big in 2012, 2013. I offered them to, to, to hook him up with Peaceville, but Peaceville wanted the devil's blood. Uh, but the Devil's Blood folded and Beast Milk signed with uh, the Finnish label because they're Finnish. Mm -hmm. And then Peace Will got none of them. <laughs> Should have listened to me now. <laughs> what, what bands are you in? Any new bands you're into right now? Brand new. From well, Massachusetts, like Stone Dagger. Stone Dagger? Yeah. 
it seems like my sidekick Arian starting a record label and wants to sign them. Oh yeah. Yeah. What what what? But do they then sound Stone like? Dagger are cool. What sort of sound are they? What do they Heavy sound like? Heavy metal, man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, not like the. When we like retro heavy metal, it's always the strange, the dusty stuff, more or less. Mm-hmm. We're not with uh, platinum blonde wigs and uh, leopard. Yeah. Charles, just forget about that. <laughs> Don't come here with some white wizard or whatever they call. That doesn't cut it, man. <laughs> I mean, if it doesn't sound untight or really damn old, it's not interesting. So mm-hmm. there's there's a divide in the metal scene for sure with those who like the modern stuff and those who like the, the old stuff but that was worse in the 2000s because that's when the old oldies came back and now I think the modern sounds are struggling a little bit but still there's always the, the modern sounding the compressed sound they're always the one that sell the most because they reach a lot of people that it's metal for those who don't really like metal mm-hmm. so they get the audience and uh, the rest get the credibility or whatever, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the, the metal scene is better than it has ever been. There's room for everybody now, even if I slag off half of them. The, this half slag our half off, so that's... Uh, what, do you, what do you say? That's a legit war. Mm-hmm. No problem there. No, yeah, oh, I like nah, the this is times. perfect. It's just like the the underground times in the late eighties. It's just like now it's everywhere. It's online. Everyone knows. It's like, there's so much great music being spread. And as I told you before, those darn twenty year old music experts, they've doubled and tripled and quadrupled and whatnot. And it's mm-hmm. just awesome. Yeah. And then there was there was the band of the week festival. A few years ago, well, right? Live Evil, it's called. It wasn't really a Band of the Week festival. It was just two guys from uh, England wanting to base a festival on just more or less underground bands and just cool bands instead of always the festivals used to have like this and that type of band to please everyone, like some sort of like golden hour on or evening on TV or something. We, we have that here. I'm not sure if you got it over there. Mm-hmm. Like you're trying to please everyone. Sometimes you don't please uh, anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but most festivals are going really great. They are having troubles now because they said when they started doing that, just festival with just cool stuff. The, um, the problem was that uh, other people started making festivals with just cool stuff as well. That's what they're saying. I mm-hmm. don't know what's uh, going on with the Live Evil Festival, but it went like three times so far. We'll see what's what will be happening with that. Mm-hmm. But uh, they're just picking bands from uh, that has been Band of the Week. And that's it, basically. That was the connection. Now, I didn't want to make any money on it. That was the first reason I said yes. And I didn't want to have to be there. That was number two. And number three was that they had to choose bands from a little bit far away as well. Mm-hmm. But that seems really difficult to always fly in Southern American bands cost money it's real cheap to fly in here in europe but it seems like yeah. it's still expensive when it's like that yeah in yeah australia too probably yeah totally and then i said no to like two australian dj tours i i don't understand why people always want to go come here to play it's like you're, you you're on the stage it's die hard for sure but i'm i'm not understanding it because you play for one hour and you use like four days to travel <laughs> to me it's weird man Oh, you mean they? Th- so they wanted you to come over there? Yes, for uh, the eternal question for mm-hmm. Dartron has always been: When you're coming here to play live, play live, play live, play live. Yeah, we've been offered ridiculous amounts of money for one-off. Yeah, why stuff. don't you do it? Uh, no, because I could write not just a book, but a book series about why I hate live. And I'm so tired of talking about that. And I've answered that in so incredible, um, incredibly many interviews. Yeah. Uh, and that's but actually the whole... But you should still do it. it. No, I wait, wait. <laughs> don't play live. I know you don't. Huh. No, I'd ra- rather you have pl- my job. And, uh, and if I'm away from home, all the emails just start building up. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Fucking painting myself into a corner again. You know, you, know, you just you just put a, an away message. I hate those away messages, man. <laughs> hate them. You could put. What about what? Just one show. Play it like the Phil's Housecore Horror Festival. No, one gig would be idi- uh, idiotic uh, because then people would question it first and foremost. Then it's a matter of having hard hands. And I don't believe in hard hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, no one really wants it. But we'd, we would need it, of course, because we're two persons. Yeah, two and guys. then I'm playing uh, drums and then I'm doing vocals a lot. So what the fuck? Yeah. What should I do? Can't do both. Yeah, you, do. you, you get like the headset mic. No, 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 no. Garth no. Brooks. <laughs> As I said, you don't want to hear the whole book series because we got like 20 minutes left here. <laughs> we got this beer and we got a skedaddle, man. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. What, you're taking care of a dog tonight? Hmm? You're taking care of a dog tonight? Yeah, we're sitting a dog. Where? Oh, we're just going to uh, the friend's place, and they got like a puppy, and we gotta be there for the puppy. Oh, like, oh, so we it can't really go shit, out or shit all like over that. the house. And then I actually prefer uh, private parties as many as I can get my hands on, compared to going out. And going out, I almost never do because when I'm out, I'm DJing. Uh, mm-hmm. How how many nights a week do you DJ? Huh? How many nights a week do you DJ? Oh hell no. Uh, I've been DJing for many years, but I quickly get tired of the, would you say, official I no, being in public like mm-hmm. that. Just talked about playing live and all that shit, so you can imagine. To me, like playing three times a month, that's... Oh, wow. Know, because you're always drinking when you're DJing. I yeah. Mean, it's mandatory. So <laughs> if you're... DJing three nights a week, then when are you going to drink with friends? Oh, that's true, yeah. And you'd probably have to, so then you're open four four times a week if you drink one night a week, and then you're on a steady road to becoming a bona fide alcoholic and party animal. And I've been there, and I've used a lot of years to just drink like two, three a week. Like two or three times a week, and that's enough for me. Mm-hmm. So I've been. Yeah, I've lost. I'm the same way. I've lost my touch. No, you don't I get lose a your touch. You. It's just. It gets harder too, though. Too much and too little just waters everything out. It fucks shit up. Mm-hmm. Two two nights a week, two three nights a week is great, but. Yeah. No, but I can't do like five six nights a week like I used to be able to do. Nah. Oh, I need more tobacco. What is that? S- just chewing tobacco? You don't chew it. Or just, it's the pouch. You quit smoking? Yeah, many years ago. Um, there's also a hassle here. You gotta smoke outside and you're gonna miss fucking half the music that's being played. I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I re- play with DJs that smoke. They put on their song and go out to smoke. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love the guys I play with, but come on, you know, it's, <laughs> what's the point? Yeah, if you don't, if you're not that interested in, but you, they need the, that thing, and I'm, I'm, of course, I understand it. After I quit smoking, it took seven years until I got like that. I wanted that thing. Uh-huh. I wanted that. But that w- took seven years. Not like one year or anything like that. It took seven years. Then it's out of the system. Wow. So I can understand how hard that sits. Wow. Old habits die hard. Wait, so with Dark Throne, like, do you guys, how often do you guys get together? Not a lot at all. Um, twice a year, maybe. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh wow! Twice a year, three times a year, maybe. 
Wow. So and then you, do you just record everything? You guys have your own. Well, he display? moved away already in the end of '91. Mm-hmm. Ted moved away in the end of '91. That means he's been like a wall for 22 years. Uh, he <laughs> chose that because he wants to go away from the urban life because he Where don't he like live? the urban life. He lives close to the Swedish border in a small, small town that has 232 people living there or something. It's really tiny, tiny. Whoa. Um, he's and so he's the misanthrope, really. And I never went away uh, uh-huh. because from Cobalt, he was like, God damn it! Well, that's part of the symbol there. That's where we grew up and started the band. I never moved more than 10, 15 kilometers away from there. Oh, wow. I've been here the whole damn time. Uh huh. And do you have family here? <coughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, the family still lives in the rehearsal place where we recorded Transylvania Hunger and, Trans- uh, and the Pounce of House. And so, so oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, that's my mama and brother lives uh-huh. in the other house. They still live out there at Winterbrew. Meaning Winter Bridge because uh-huh. it's, it's a huge lake between Winterbro and Kolbotten. This lake was used to, in the olden days, to do like timber with the horses and shit. And mm-hmm. then the lake froze, so it's Winter Bridge. Mm-hmm. You didn't cut a lot of uh, or um, transport a lot of timber in the summertime because it was horrible. Now in the winter time, you could go by lakes and shit, and it's gliding better. So that was like a main road for that in the old days. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it's not really interesting. Come on, hit me with something <laughs> else. I just no, know I these things because I care about like my home place. Yeah. What else do you do uh, that that people be surprised by? That like when you're not listening to music, DJing, or doing Dark Throne. Well, <laughs> what does what does Fenris do for Fenris? Well, I was just listening to this. I told you this track by uh, Kerry Chandler called Oblivion. And that's just like he's mentioning about talking about yourself in the third, not the third person, but the third party. Mm -hmm. What kind of dialect is that from the States States, when you say, stop talking about yourself in the third party? I don't know. I've never That's heard really that. strange because in my head, every time I want to mouth along with that track, I go uh-huh. like third person because I just heard like five times yet, but I haven't learned to say party yet because it's so un- unusual and strange. Um, what else? Uh, what I really like to do is uh, beat mix, a deep, deep, uh, dirty, classy but dirty house on decks. Mm-hmm. But that I do for myself and just make podcasts for anyone out there that wanna uh, that does that kind of podcasting. I spend 50% of my listening time listening to electronic rhythmic music. Oh, and wow. I have been doing it since 92. Yeah. So I got a huge, huge collection, huge, huge heart for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing can take that away from me. That's Would you nothing. ever make make an album? Of that sort of music? No, I told you earlier, like, since I was a kid, the first guitar was always, like, the coolest thing. Like, yeah. I could hear the first album I, I got when I was, I was two years old in 73, and I got Morrison Hotel by The Doors, and it was mm-hmm. this track on that one called uh, Waiting for the Sun, and it's fucking heavy mm-hmm. with, I, I mean, uh, slow, like, almost proto-doom in a way if you, if you look at it with a bright eye and a Clinton and Milkman's eye. What? You can't say that there. Um, and my first guitar was just... And then, then I got the Uriah Heap album the year after. And it was mm-hmm. just full of first guitar. And that's the coolest shit ever. Uh, and then I started to play it myself. And then a lot of the magic was lost because I started to know how they were playing. I was playing myself. But mm-hmm. uh, the magic wasn't there anymore. I knew the the mechanism on how to make it, uh, make the music. And that was a deliberate choice for me not to do the same thing with with programming. Um, mm-hmm. So, to, yeah, to keep it a mystery, so you... It's still a fucking so it's mystery. it's still fun. I still don't 
tweak any knobs or uh -huh. still no. I made two ambient albums, but that was different. That's different. That's more synthesizer stuff. It's not really. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not rhythmic electronic music at all. I'm saying rhythmic electronic music because if I say house, people think about like crap music, and if uh, if I say techno, people think about crap music. But you have to remember that for people that just like opera, they think of all metal as one thing. They don't hear yeah. the difference of total crap metal and really awesome metal. They don't fucking hear the difference between Negative Plane and Tiger Tales or Pretty Boy Floyd. So uh -huh. people need to know that there's a huge difference. And the difference just gets bigger and bigger for more and more you delve into music style. And I've... Let's just say three, four hours a day listening to this for 22 years now. I'm totally sold. So that's one thing I do. Wait, but three I never or kept four. it a sec uh, secret or anything. It's just yeah. people just refuse to believe. Wait, three, three or four hours a day? And I got that in 95, so... Wow. Wait, three or four hours a day of techno? Or not of house and techno? Yeah, most deep styles of the, mm -hmm. the genre. Uh, bobbing between 118 BPM and 125 BPM. That's the sweet spot. Yeah, yeah. They say mo most hit songs are 120. Most hit songs? Hit the, the hits. The hits Don't of today. Don't break my heart. <laughs> freaky, freaky. I'm thinking you're right already! <laughs> <laughs> No, it's a good tempo. It's a good tempo for metal as well, actually. Yeah. And then what do you listen to? How, how many hours of music do you listen to a day? Because I don't have straight days. I have many days I don't listen to music at all, like every Sunday. Sundays I barely listen to music. Other days I listen to music like entire day. But I don't know if... There, I mean, there's so many others out there that are completely music-obsessive. And that is a fantastic thing to know. Because at one point I was feeling really alone. They just... Mm -hmm. they A lot of them tend to just base themselves around rock or some other style. But I mix it up a lot. And you would know when you check this shit out. Yeah. But that's like intentionally fucked up. There's no real house on here no real metal on here is other stuff that's hard to categorize you know yeah there's a 1940 uh, 1945 Italy I'm excited yeah, the guy to hear I'm this. going to now that's the guy who uh, gave me that song but there has a natural um, answer to that there was one scene in Breaking Bad when there was like this guy who was working the, the where they were making the chemicals, and he was really just, like strange and eccentric oh, and Gil. annoying, uh, annoying figure. And he got shot while his song was playing, and he was singing along a little bit to this song, and that's like the oh. annoying song. But to me, this annoying music that was just mm -hmm. baked into that scene just to make him weirder and more annoying and easier to shoot. Did that's great music to me. Did you watch all of Breaking Bad? No, initially I stopped watching Breaking Bad because I hated that fuck up that Jesse. Jesse? Yeah, I hated him because he was Why? fucking up all the time. He was fucking up. I like the lawyer. Oh yeah, Bob Odenkirk. <laughs> yeah, he, he's uh, he's getting his own show. <laughs> call you be better call Saul. <laughs> better call Saul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're giving him a spinoff series. Right says no. I hated um, Heisenberger or what he's called in 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 real life in Breaking Bad I hated his wife and uh, the son a lot of people hated I, her uh, I, uh, I, I like Walter the, Jr. the brother-in-law the cop oh yeah I like him just a terrific role Hank I like him but, but his wife again is bugging me there's a lot of characters bugging me on that show yeah well, that's me it. and the missus we used to just watch crime series which is really huge in Norway and in the uh, UK wait so you didn't want you how crime much Spring Bad did you watch? European court crime series. You saw Gil get killed, though. Huh? So, you must have watched a lot of it if you if you know that scene, though, yeah, when Gil gets killed. Yeah, because I continued to watch because a lot of people told me to just stick to it. Just fuck. When did you stop, though? That's insane. It's like two years ago, but I, I no. I, oh, so you've missed like the last two seasons? Yeah, I probably got the last two seasons left. You got to watch it. 
yeah, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, but I stopped. No, no, you don't understand. First I stopped, then I started again, uh-huh. and then we have a little hiatus now. But we're gonna. Oh, keep you're watching. gonna finish. I, I think we finished the fifth uh, series now. Oh, okay. So, yeah, you'll so be, I'm not like totally you're not dead giving, in the water. You're not giving. You're not giving. giving up on it. I watched the whole thing. Uh, I started two months before the final season and watched it like nonstop. It's but it, didn't, it didn't blow my mind or anything. One thing that blew my mind was Arrested Development first season. Yeah, that's a great show. Because I was laughing by myself, mm-hmm. like watching it like alone. That's like that's as great as the one purpose that is great in life. Now never let you down is when you get goosebumps of a great song, and that happens. I'm sorry to say, people, if you end up like me. Getting the DJ disease, just more and more desperate for that. It's so great, it's almost great, but I'm some some time along the way, I lost that. I've lost that goosebump <laughs> feeling. <laughs> you know, uh, that, that yeah. rarely happens anymore, and I so fucking miss that mm-hmm. the goosebump feeling. Because if shit give me goosebumps, then I give it three underlinings and a little extra. Yeah. What do you think about? Because I. I find like you know, not just not just in metal, but with all you know, with rock and pop music, I feel like that so much they don't the the songwriting isn't it's it's like all frosting and no cake. Do you agree with that? Where they're in general like what what's considered a great song now is just like is so thin. I don't really know anymore because another thing that hits people like me i'm 42 now uh is talk to all the djs and they just stop listening to uh contemporary uh popular stuff mm-hmm. uh, not that i ever really did but i was actually i was at the point like 10 years ago when i was sh- i was actually checking out yeah yeah yes and and white stripes a bit but that thing is all gone now man yeah but when I came in here, you remember? He was playing something. That yeah, the new. OCs, yeah. I doubt if I'm going to check it out more than this, though, because I got old shit. Yeah. I got old well, shit that waits that, for me, man. But that that, but that illustrates new, my point, all though. All the new contemporary stuff I'm checking out, what do you think that is? The one genre I'm still listening to all the time. It's the house tech group stuff. Mm-hmm. So... On my MP3 player, I got lots of new stuff, but it tends to be the older tracks and retro, in, even in that genre, that I get a kick well, out. Well, yeah, that's, that happened the same way. But I wonder why that is. Like, why, why is it... Why is it like... Like, it's not like in 20, 30 years we're going to be listening to what what's happening now. I don't know. I don't, listening I don't to something freaky from 1975, something oddball seems immensely more interesting yeah than today's people i got one exception in my book and that's it's just too little i got meridian brothers from colombia they mm-hmm. got one song that i'm really into and i've been What's dating that? a lot uh, it's strange wonky real wonky uh music what what's the one song now uh Con el whisky de folklore. Uh, oh, it's here. Oh, nice. There, man. Oh, nice. Uh, Meridian Brothers. Right there, number five. It's there. Fiesta con el whisky oh, cool. de folklore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's new. But it sounded when I first heard it. I thought it was from like 1974 and it was fucked up. I was disappointed when mm-hmm. I found out it was from 2012. But mm-hmm. well, then I was happy that it was cr- from Colombia, not Mexico, that I thought. Because it was even more freaked out. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, when it was Colombian and, and not Mexican. Yeah. Wow. So, so basically, you're just a grown-up weirdo kid uh, in your head, and that's the basis of your DJing. But mm-hmm. underneath it all, there's some sort of class, or I don't know, some sort of cultivation, but very little. I don't read about music. I just listen. Mm-hmm. And my DJ freak friends, they read, too. So mm. they seem to be like, but they don't listen to house and techno. Yeah. Which, but they are all about rock and they know everything. Mm-hmm. 
put on anything by Eddie and the Hot Rods, and they know like everything about the band, and they know like that song title they have there. That's been done by this and that other guy, completely different band. Got just they can go on and on and on. And on. Mm-hmm. I don't read about music, and as you can see in my posts on the band of the week, I don't like to write either. But I'm being asked constantly to write about. Mm-hmm. But it's so obvious I don't like to write about music. I like to listen to it. So my yeah. posts are like, this is good. I like. But that that's enough, though, I think. <laughs> Seemingly, it's enough. But it yeah. should be enough. I think, yeah. To use the ears, you know. Yeah, I think, every, you know, it's like either yes or no. It's getting close to wrap-up oh, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah we got to wrap it up. You got to get out to the suburbs. Well, thanks for talking to me. No problem. What, what did we not cover yet? We probably got like four minutes. Four minutes? Yeah. Uh, of all this? Of what did, What we didn't cover. Oh, yeah, yeah. For what's left? Let's see. Make it medley like the final song on the Spastic Blur album. Like they, uh, it's just like a seven minute long song. And they, at the, at the end, four or five seconds, they do a... Uh, a medley of what they already sung about. They're, so they're like a short version of <laughs> like a tr- <laughs> sort of after trailer of what they just sung about. Hilarious. <laughs> Humor in music, it's difficult, but Spastic Blur is okay. Sp- spastic Burrow? Spastic Blur. Blur. Spastic Blur with the... Si- you're not really familiar with the Portland bands, are you, sir? The, the what? The Portland bands. No. Oh, first Dead Moon. I thought they were Australian. I never checked them out, but I, I got it. They got sound great. Them and everything. But when it comes to Portland, again, then we have Wehrmacht. And the side project of Wehrmacht was Spastic Blur. And Spastic Blur was one of the first bands signed to Eric. Oh, wow. And I don't think so Wehrmacht was. So from the 80s. Yeah, well, I'm lost in the 80s, man. Mm-hmm. Shoot me. <laughs> what? Shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this right now playing? I have no idea. Got a tambourine. That's always good. That always takes things to the next level. Okay, wrapping this up, we were talking about Ghost earlier, and I had uh, a column in uh, the biggest uh, metal magazine in the world, probably, which is German Rock Hard, started in 82. Mm-hmm. And uh, Götz, the editor, uh, said to me, you get money, you write something called Fenris View. You can review anything you want, just one, every month. And then to explain some of the why Ghost is strangely appealing to a lot of people is that I'm listening to the Elder album by Kiss and I'm thinking there's a lot of theatrical stuff going on there that is quite similar to what Ghost's doing and I'm trying mm-hmm. to explain that um, and the, the in, in the review mm-hmm. and the other day we're moving house so now I just have a fucking computer playing music not a whole fucking huge stereo. Mm-hmm. And I'm playing Under the Rose, which is one of the coolest songs from The Elder by Kiss. It has to... Under the Rose. Really bombastic theatrical uh, refrain. But what happens? I mean, usually I've been listening to this with some sort of bass and, and, and volume and then going through the little laptop... I can, for the first time, hear the very present now, tambourine. Mm-hmm. On top of the most, one of the most bombastic refrains ever. Mm-hmm. I quickly texted some Kiss experts, aficionados out there. I texted them about the tambourine, and one of them was going like, I never noticed before. Thank you for <laughs> ruining my day, because <laughs> now I can't get it out of my head. It's there <laughs> all the time now. <laughs> Crisis. Thank you, Amo. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for talking to me. Wait, you gotta say. You gotta say it in the mic. So we sign off. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Henris. <laughs> this uh, went we did by it. all too quickly. Actually, it was like 
one hour and 20 minutes or something yeah exactly like, you're like a you're like rain man or something literally it's ex- right now it's exactly one hour and 20 minutes got a built-in clock that's you're good yeah my my family-in-law don't have that makes for problems sometimes it's a good skill <laughs> <laughs> you need to use any of my skills <laughs> 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 you know what movie wait what Napoleon Dynamite. Oh yeah. 